um, anthrax, which we do have in this area, um, especially if you work around sheep. Sheep have been carriers for anthrax for years. So if you start homesteading and you're growing sheep, be aware that you may be exposed to anthrax. Um, it also works on malaria, which is not so much a big problem here, but we do have mosquitoes here. And all it takes is for one person to have been exposed to malaria to spread it to the mosquito population. So anthrax is naturally occurring? Yeah. Anthrax is naturally occurring anyway. It's, it's a, it creates a spore, and that's how the sheep get it, is they, uh, as they're moving around in the desert and stuff, bedding down, stuff like that, they kick up the spore and it gets on their wool. And um, so anthrax is, is not a problem until it leaves that spore state and then it gets, becomes a problem. That's why the anthrax powder, once you inhale it, then it becomes a problem in your lungs. As long as it's in the powder form, it's totally safe. Just don't get it wet and moist and warm. That's when it leaves the spore form and becomes virulent, becomes uh, toxic. But doxy you can't store. Two years, they say, natural toxic. What, doxycycline? Yeah. Mm -mm, not true at all. Yep. The military did a study. There are a few drugs that do become toxic. Tetracyclines become toxic. Doxycycline um, does just fine up for up to 10 years. Okay. So what is the, say, shelf life, storage life? Is I'll, get, the, I'll get that in a second. And as I said, the military did a study of, of all the different medications and antibiotics and pills that you can take and which ones become toxic, which ones lose potency, how well do they store, they stopped doing the experiment after 40 years because um, they didn't notice a big change in most of your medications. If it's in a dry powder form and you keep it cool, preferably below 40 degrees, but anything kept below 70 degrees, kind of like food storage, it can last indefinitely. Um, there's a few that do become toxic. Tetracycline, doxycycline was more stable. Um, that's why I like doxy and not tetracycline. Because you can get tetracyclines at pet stores and stuff too. Uh, but I, I don't have it on the list because it becomes toxic after about a year. It can become more toxic to take. Um, malaria. Um, anybody who served in the military, do you guys remember getting those little doxy tablets? Did you take one a day, every day that you were in the Middle East? Anybody here in the military? Oh. Or the air shots they used to get. Yep. Well, in the Middle East, malaria is a big problem. So when I was over there, we had to take doxycycline every day, 100 milligrams every day as a prophylaxis against malaria. Um, I didn't miss a day. And I've never had malaria, so it must work. One thing to keep in mind with doxycycline is that it increases your sensitivity to sunlight. To what? Sunlight. So it is really easy to get sunburned if your person is taking doxycycline. It decreases our ability to filter out the UV radiation and we get sunburns really easy. Um, erythromycin. Has anybody heard of a Z-Pak before? Got on your doctor and gotten a Z pack. That was azithromycin. Uh, same family of drugs. So this does work the same. Again, again good for respiratory stuff. Uh, it's good for systemic infections. It's good for if you can't take amoxicillin, erythromycin is a good one to take instead. Different family of drugs. Oh, sorry. Cipro. Um, Again, good, general, all-around drug. It fell out of favor because they started noticing that it, it can have an effect where it weakens your tendons and can cause tendon rupture if you take it for a long period of time and if you give it to really young kids. So it's got its pros, it's got its cons. Keep in mind that ciprofloxacin has been associated with Achilles tendon rupture and uh, so I wouldn't take it a lot, but it's one of those good, general, broad-spectrum antibiotics. 
Uh, if you're allergic to sulfa drugs, it's the number one prescribed drugs for UTIs. So it's good on pits and parks places. Okay. And the last one on the list is sulfameth trimethoprim or Bactrim. Okay. Again, this is uh, a good general broad spectrum. It is a sulfa drug. So if you're allergic to sulfa drugs, don't take this one. But again, it is a super good drug for UTI, urinary tract, um, type infections like that. So you notice that everything here fits kind of the general areas of different, different body parts of your body. Respiratory, mouth, infections, and then urinary tract. Because that's where we get most of all of our infections. It's either in our nose, mouth, ears, throat, stomach, skin, or urinary tracts. Yeah? Okay. Now we talked about some really good antibiotics, both herbal and natural. Let's talk about when not to use them. Antibiotics only work if it's a bacteria that's causing the problem. I don't know how many times I've had people come into the ER or a doctor's office and say, hey, I'm sick, I need some antibiotics. No, you have a virus. Back, back, antibiotics are not going to work on you. And if you abuse antibiotics, you get antibiotic resistant strains. They do mutate and they don't work anymore. So some general rules that you can use to kind of tell the difference between a bacterial infection versus a viral infection are these basic principles. Bacterial, the symptoms usually hit pretty fast. You'll be fine one minute, and then over the next half hour to an hour, or even a few hours, you're just not feeling good. You go from being okay to, I feel like trash. They hit pretty fast. Um, usually you'll have pain in a specific spot. Um, I hurt, oh, right here. Or it hurts right there in my throat or wherever the infection is centralized or located, it hurts right there. Whereas viruses tend to be kind of a general, uh, my body just aches. It's harder to pinpoint an exact spot that hurts. Um, and viruses are usually worse at night. They're not sure why. It's just one of those things that we've noticed. As long as you're moving about doing stuff during the day and doing things, you can have a cold and still kind of function. You try to sleep and you can't sleep, you can't breathe, your body hurts. Uh, for some reason, the symptoms are just usually worse at night. Um, bacterial infections um, usually last quite a while because the bacteria is gonna keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Whereas a virus, your body attacks it and kind of, what we call self-limiting diseases. Two, three days, five days max, it's a virus. If you were sick for three days and it went away, it was a virus. If you were sick for two weeks, more often than not, it was bacterial. There are some viruses like the flu that last for two weeks, but that's one of the rare exceptions. Usually viral is gonna be a few days. So if you've got what we call viral gastroenteritis, which is fancy words for vomiting and diarrhea. It's going to go away usually in three to five days because it's a self-limiting disease. So a lot of vomiting and a lot of diarrhea like that, um, that took a little bit of time to develop, you know, where you just kind of had an upset stomach and then the next day you started getting vomiting and diarrhea. It's probably viral. Don't do anything for it. Let it run its course. Don't do the ginger, don't do the everything else until you've emptied everything out and then you need to start slowing it down. Um, your body needs to cleanse itself. That's what it's doing. That's why it only lasts about three days. Um, same thing with food poisoning. The body needs to get rid of the bacteria that's causing it. So let it run its course, let it vomit, let it diarrhea. But if it lasts more than about three days, you wanna start considering some of your antibiotics. Um, bacterias, 
almost always have a fever and it can get pretty high pretty quick. And if you guys, we'll talk about fever here in a little bit. Fever is not our enemy. I can't stress that enough. Fevers are good. If you think fevers are bad, I'll change the way you think in a little bit. Um, viruses, you can have fevers or not, but if you do, they're usually kind of a low grade fever. Um, 100, 101, you know, your body just doesn't feel good. What your body is doing when it has a fever is that it's increasing the temperature to try to create an environment where if it's bacteria or viral, either one can't survive. So you don't want to be giving antipyretics like Tylenol and ibuprofen and feverfew and peppermint oil and stuff like that to get rid of the fevers. Don't give them cold baths. You need the fevers. There are times when fevers become counterproductive, but generally speaking, fevers are your friends. I feel like Bruce from Finding Nemo. Fevers are friends, not fearful. Okay. Yes, sir. At what point does a fever become counterproductive? Um, 104, 105. At 107, you can start to get brain damage. So what's the body trying to do? Fight the infection. If you, if you drop the fever, you're going to be sicker for longer. So when it gets up to 104, 105, it's just out of control? It's just out of control. It needs help. So then you need to be, if you're not already doing herbs and stuff to help fight the infection, you need to be. And, and if, that's, if that doesn't bring the fever down, then you need to start thinking about some of your antipyretics like Tylenol and ibuprofen. Okay, but let the fever run its course. All right, so let's talk about a few specific conditions. Pain. Generally speaking, uh, most pain can be taken care of pretty easily. Um, again, these are all short-term acute problems. This is not, hey, I've got chronic back pain and I've had it for 15 years. Nothing here is going to fix that. You'll probably have back pain the rest of your life unless you do something different. But if you have a new problem that's hurting, Tylenol, 15 milligrams per kilogram every four to six hours, pretty standard dosages right off the bottle. If you, you're going to find that in medicine and herbs both, a lot of things are weight-based. Um, and that's so that you don't overdose on stuff. Tylenol is extremely toxic to your liver. So these kids who take Norcos and Lortabs and Percocets and Darvocets uh, trying to be drama queens or try to commit suicide are not dying from the opiates in it. That's really easy for us to fix. We hit them with a medicine called Narcan, boom, reverses it, not a problem. What they are dying from is the Tylenol in all of those pills. It kills their liver and they go into liver failure and they die or go on a transplant list. And that'll happen very quickly if you put... Oh, yo, absolutely. These kids who take a bottle of Tylenol, killing their livers right there. right there. More than about two grams of Tylenol and you've caused liver damage. How easy is it to get two grams of Tylenol? Well, each Lortab or Vicodin or whatever they're, they're calling it, Norco, whatever they're calling it nowadays, has 325 milligrams of Tylenol in it. And five or seven or 10 milligrams of what's called um, hydrocodone or hydromorphone. That's the opiate. 325 milligrams of Tylenol and a little bit of opiates. Six of those in here. Six of those and you've caused liver damage. So don't take six Tylenol at once. A little bit every six hours. Give your body a chance to filter it out. But if you take a whole bunch at once, you're causing liver damage. So that was just my question. Was with the regular Tylenol, you know, you're comparing it with the opioids and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking over-the-counter regular Tylenol... It's the same amount of Tylenol. It's the same amount. Okay. So if you're following <laughs> the prescribed... Prescribed times and stuff, it gives your body a chance to filter it out. That's why you should never take more than a certain amount of Tylenol in a 24-hour period. Same thing with your, your ibuprofen, okay? No more than two grams of Tylenol in a 24-hour period. That's a lot of Tylenol. 
okay? Uh, no more than 2,400 milligrams of ibuprofen in a 24-hour period. You'll kill your kidneys. Follow the weight-based stuff on the bottles. It's really hard to overdose if you follow the weight-based prescriptions. Um, if you've got a really bad pain, take a Tylenol and ibuprofen, alternate it every four hours, so every two hours you're taking something, and add a little bit of wild lettuce to it. Start with a quarter cup of a medicinal tea, and if that doesn't work, take another quarter cup, and another quarter cup, or take a cup until you get relief. This is going to work like your opiates do in your Vicodins, in your Lortabs, but it's not habit forming. It's not addictive. So take a Tylenol and a little bit of wild lettuce. That's like taking a Lortab. What did you say is too much ibuprofen? 2,400 milligrams okay. in a 24 hour period. So 24 and 24. If you take three 800 milligrams, you're done for 24 hours. Yeah, I used to get it in 800 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So you take one in the morning, one in the middle of the day, and one at night before you go to bed. And don't take any extras. If you take extras, you're damaging your kidneys. <coughs> this is why medicines can be so dangerous, guys. This is why when I started creating these classes beforehand, I talked to a lot of the docs in the area so they wouldn't freak out that I was teaching you guys to practice medicine without licenses. No, we're just educating you so that you stop hurting yourselves, okay? Um, poplar bark, again, it's an aspirin. Two to 500 milligrams, up to three times a day. Turmeric, this is for pain, not for diabetes. Uh, 500 to a gram, twice a day. Um, some people it works great on, for chronic stuff, not so much. It's a great anti-inflammatory herb. Um, cayenne pepper or ointment or essential oils. Uh, cayenne really should be used as a topical pain reliever, not an internal consumed pain reliever. Um, so you wanna mix this in your salves, ointments, and stuff like that. Rub it on the areas that hurt, like, um, like a sports rub. Use it like a sports rub, okay? The way that cayenne pepper works as a pain reliever is that it causes pain to distract your brain from the other pain. That's the way it works. So what is it good for internally? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Stops bleeding. Yeah, it helps stop bleeding, but yeah, it's, I, mean, I use it mainly for blood pressure control. Depends on which ones, but yes. And it can, on all of these things can affect your prescriptions. So don't take any of these herbs and medications together without talking to a doctor first or consulting some sort of text that tells you how they work, what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, because they can work together in good ways and they can work together in bad ways. Does the cayenne bring the blood to that area? Yeah, it's what's called a rubefacient. So it causes localized uh, blood vessel dilation. That's why it works for blood pressure. If you take it internally, it causes blood vessel dilation systemically in your whole body. Uh, Dr. Christopher was a huge advocate that he could stop a heart attack with two tablespoons of red pepper in a glass of warm water. And he had patients that he says he did that with because they drank it and it dilated their blood vessels in their heart and it stopped the heart attack. I haven't done that, so I can't tell you how it works. Isn't that burn going down? Oh, it sure does. <laughs> yep, or you can use uh, a tincture under your tongue. And keep in mind, it's red pepper, it's going to burn. It's not pleasant. What's that? It's good on pizza. You should eat pizza with red peppers to stop your heart attack. But you're going to find is that almost all of the herbs that we're using medicinally are culinary herbs. Let your food be your medicine. Let your diet change the way your health is working. Okay, let your food be your medicine. This last one I had to add recently because gosh darn it, it works and it's legal now. 
CBD oil. This is a distilled cannabis oil that does not have the THC hallucinogen in it. And so you can put it in a little vape machine and nebulize it, vaporize it, and it's an excellent pain reliever. Does the wild lettuce affect your brain? Like the other way, the opiates do? Or nope. Anything? You can still work and You can still it. work and take it. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. It's not addictive. And because it doesn't affect the uh, euphoria part of your brain, like, like heroin does, um, you can still work with it. Just make sure you know how your body reacts to it. Because it does still affect the... Uh, I used to always tell my students, morphine is not a pain reliever. It's a pain I don't care anymore. <laughs> okay? It does absolutely nothing to relieve your pain. What it does is that it affects the emotional interpreting part of your brain to where you don't care that you're in pain anymore. Well, wild lettuce works the same way. But it doesn't give you that euphoria high that you can get off narcotics. But it can make you to where you don't care that you're in pain. It works the same way on the proteins in your brain called the GABA protein. You just don't care anymore. But it's not an opiate, so it's legal. And it's not quite as strong as, as opium. Um, like I said, it's kind of self-limiting. You can take it and take it and take it and your body's going to go, ugh, I'm sick of that. So stop. Fevers. Again, there are friends, not our enemies. Um, Tylenol and ibuprofen both work on the hypothalamus in your brain to reset the temperature setting inside your brain. And that's how they work on lowering fevers. Um, if you've ever had little kids, doctor always said, do Tylenol, two hours later, do ibuprofen, you can do Tylenol again in two hours. That will help control their fevers. And they're absolutely right. What they forget is, is that fevers are not bad. Okay. Um, and then you're going to say, what about febrile seizures, Josh? It's not about how high the fever gets that causes the seizure in kids and adults. It's how fast it changes. We talked about this in the last earlier, earlier classes, right? Um, if you're getting a gradual increase in your temperatures, your brain can handle it. If it spikes up really fast and changes over an hour to two hours from nothing to really high, your body's going to have a seizure. Um, if you give these medicines on a really high fever, you can lower their body temperature too fast. So be careful with these. It's always easier to give more and you can't take medicine back out. So give small doses of stuff. So like where there's a range on ibuprofen, 10 to 15, always start at 10. If that doesn't work, then try a 15 milligrams per kilogram. But always give small amounts of stuff. You can always give more, but you can't take it back out. Um, aspirin does the same thing. It's an antipyretic, works with the hypothalamus, changes your body's set temperature. Poplar bark is just a natural aspirin. Feverfew is a great medicinal herb um, that is an antipyretic that works just the same way as everything else. It, except that it has the extra benefit of being what's called a diaphoretic. It makes you sweat. And as you sweat, it evaporates and cools your body. So I like feverfew for fevers probably better than anything. And again, it's a medicinal tea, not an herbal tea. So you're going to take as much of the herb as you can, put it in a small container, pour in some boiling water to just barely cover it, let it sit for about 10 minutes, filter it out, and then drink it. Drink half of it first. And if it doesn't come down, drink the other half. So you got to pay attention to fluid intake to keep up with your sweat. Yes, but you should be hydrating anyway. We talked about dehydration last time, right? And how almost all of our problems are either caused by or made worse by dehydration. Or that's, that, that's the last class. We'll talk about that more in the last class. Um, I'm talking everything from hemorrhoids to obesity. It's because you're dehydrated. And we'll talk about why. Infected wounds. 
Um, and again, this is not exhaustive. We talked about other things besides this, but these are just some ideas you could do. Um, colloidal silver and honey. Colloidal silver is an excellent man antimicrobial, but it takes direct contact for it to work. Um, so it's great on superficial stuff. You can take it internally. Um, it works. That's about it. It works. Don't take a ton. There is a risk that you can turn into a blue man or gray man syndrome where the silver collects under your skin. Um, it's extremely rare. And in all the cases, they were taking way more than they were supposed to. We're talking teaspoons here, guys. Small amounts. If you're drinking glasses of colloidal silver, uh, you've hit that point of diminishing returns. You're not, you're not going to get any more benefit from a glass than you are from a teaspoon or two. Uh, mix the two together, smear it on whatever it's infected, helps wonderfully. Um, I would do that for the first 24 hours, and then I'd follow that with a comfrey and marigold poultice. And I'd probably mix some rosemary and oregano essential oils into it as well. Um, rosemary and oregano essential oils were the number one antibiotic in that experiment my son did. They were hands down the best one out of everything cold of silver, garlic, augmentin, Keflex. I even got some of the fun stuff, the vancomycin from the hospital. And rosemary and oregano did better than all of them. What, what is EO water? Essential oil. So you take a few drops of essential oil and eight ounces of water. And yes, they will dissolve. Essential oils dissolve in water. They're not like regular oils that don't dissolve in water. They do dissolve in water. So one of the things I like to do is those uh, diffusers, misters. When flu season hits, I like to put rosemary and oregano in with the water in my diffusers, my essential oil diffusers. Puts it into the air. You're breathing it in all the time. It hits all the surfaces in your house. It's a great way to prevent getting sick. Um, echinacea, again, supports your immune system. You want two double aught capsules. There's different sizes of capsules. These are double zero capsules twice a day. And sorry, I didn't explain BID and TID, did I? Uh, BID stands for twice per day. TID is three times a day. QID, four times a day. Um, it's a, it's a medical terminology, sorry. I ran out of space. So on each page I try to put BID two times per day someplace on it. Uh, and again, Keflex is probably the last thing I would use for a wound infection because you're using an antibiotic now and it's, uh, you don't really have anything else afterwards. So 500 milligrams, which is one tablet, twice a day. And please, don't save your antibiotics. If you're told to take an antibiotic by a doctor for 10 days, take it for 10 days. Even if you feel better after five days, don't save the rest of it. For next time I get this, I'll just take this antibiotic. That's what's caused a lot of these antibiotic resistant strains is people not finishing their antibiotics. You gotta finish all of it. Make sure it's dead. Otherwise it comes back stronger. And uh, so if you're prescribed an antibiotic for 10 days or 14 days or however long the doctor tells you, take all of it. Don't save it. We've got plenty of other sources and things for antibiotics. You don't need to be save, saving and hanging on to those prescription antibiotics. Take them. Otherwise, you're wasting it. You're, you're, you're counteracting it. Okay, so the um, commercial or the regular medical antibiotics that... Mm -hmm. They sure do. They're rough on you. Can you go back and, and repopulate that gut biome? Yep. Do any of the other medicinal approaches have that same effect? I didn't think nope. Okay. Good point. You're right. The reason why I saved the pharmaceuticals for last is because they are so rough on your body. It's not uncommon that after somebody's been on a course of Keflex or Augmentin or... Uh, yeah, well, that is an antifungal. 
they, uh, they have to take a diflucan afterwards because they get a yeast infection because you've killed all the good bacteria in your body. So now the yeast in your body takes over um, or you get diarrhea afterwards. <coughs> it's because you've upset the natural balance of stuff in your body. The herbal stuff doesn't do it near the extent that the commercial stuff does, if at all. So um, if you're taking antibiotics, you should always use some probiotics afterwards. Yogurt, dirt, um, kefir. kefir, kombucha. I like dirt. Dirt works great. Worked for, worked for kids for, for centuries and thousands of years. Uh, one of the worst things we've done is we're too clean. I give my dog a tablespoon of plain yogurt and meal mm -hmm. because of the stomach. He's 15 and a half years old and the stomach's pretty sensitive. Yeah. Uh, make sure it's an active yogurt, not a dead yogurt. It's got to have live cultures in it. Um, gosh darn it, we're just too clean. Is there something we can do with our fresh rosemary and or, or, um, oregano that we grow that will give us our essential oil properties? Yep, teas. Just make them into teas. Make them into teas. Medicinal teas, not herbal teas. So again, you're going to take whatever container you're going to make your tea in and fill it full of that herb. Add boiling water to it don't boil it, add boiling water to it. Let it steep for 10 minutes. Then drink that. Uh, that's going to give you, it's going to save most of your essential oils. If you're boiling it, most of your essential oils are vaporizing and going out. So you want to cover it. It's, 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 it's a decoction, not a, not a, not a tea. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Decoctions, infusions, and teas are so close that it's it's hard to tell them apart sometimes but if you want to save the essential oils of whatever you're you're doing your detoxion or tea with cover it so the oils stay inside and then right before you drink it knock all that stuff back inside strain it and then drink it excellent questions any other questions so far you got a few more and then we're done guys we're actually be on time Woohoo! lung infections Mullen leaf tea, one cup every two to three hours, or if you powder it, encapsulate it, you want two double lot capsules three times a day. If you've got a cough that's associated with your respiratory infection, raspberry leaf tea and lobelia tea work really good to it. So here's what I would do. I would mix the raspberry leaf and the lobelia with the mullen if you have a respiratory infection with a cough. If you just have a cough that you can't get rid of, raspberry leaf and lobelia. By the way, raspberry leaf works great for diarrhea too. Um, if you're stuffy, congested, both in your lungs and your sinuses, um, eucalyptus essential oil steam baths work wonderful. There's a reason why Vicks Vapor Rub opened up your passages as a kid. That menthol and from uh, mentholatum, Eucalyptus oil, it's all the same thing, it's all menthol based. Um, does a wonderful job of opening up your air passages. Um, the nice thing about the teas is that once you're done drinking them, and you've got a little left over, you can use what's called a neti pot. Have you guys heard of that yet? Okay. Put it in your neti pot, do a nasal rinse with it. It'll help that way too. There's a reason why cocaine addicts snort the cocaine. There's a wonderful bed of blood vessels in your nose that absorb medications and substances really fast. And that's where usually you've got congestion and stuff occurring, inflammation. So doing a, an herbal tea or medicinal tea in a neti pot, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, you're pouring water up your nose. If those don't work, Again, doxycycline is a great drug, 100 milligrams twice a day um, for the first day, and then 50 milligrams twice a day after that. But garlic works great for respiratory stuff. Fresh garlic, not cooked garlic. Take a whole clove and just swallow the whole clove. Don't chew it up, it burns. <laughs> swallow it. Um, and again, erythromycin, same family as your z your azithromycin. It's 
great for respiratory infections too. Nausea and vomiting. Candied ginger um, for severe vomiting where they can't keep anything down, where um, if you suck on the ginger and you swallow it, it makes you throw up. Uh, ginger tinctures work great because they just under your tongue, you don't swallow anything and it absorbs really fast. So you're not throwing it back up. Um, some over-the-counter stuff, meclizine and dramamine are great for motion sickness related nausea. Um, so what they're usually used for, but they work for regular nausea too, just not as well. Um, my go-to for nausea and vomiting is ginger. I love it. Does a fabulous job. And again, we're talking five to 10 drops, just small amounts of, 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 of tincture. I still see pens going like crazy. Again, you guys will have access to these slides on, online. But you can get Dramamine and Meclizine at the dollar store. And they work great. Meclizine? They're, again, they're usually used more for like motion sickness related nausea, but they do work on regular nausea too because um, your prescription stuff, your Phenergans, your Zofrans, your Compazines, um, they're prescription. It's hard, hard to get those. Uh, and I haven't found a, a non-prescription source without going to like an international pharmacy type stuff to get those. So I, fortunately my doctor is really nice and knows that I'm a freak. And so when my kids get sick and I use my medicines that are prescription medicines at home, he refills them for me. So I have bottles of Zofran at home in my fridge that if I need it, I can do an injection or whatever with my kids. So he, talk to your doctors. The more educated you are about what's going on and why you're doing it, the more likely they are to maybe accommodate you a little bit. Earaches. Okay, let's talk about earaches real quick. There are two main types of earaches, ear infections. You have outer ear infections called otitis externa. Okay, this is swimmer's ear. Fungal, and they're usually fungal infections. And then you have inner or middle ear infections. Uh, these are your earaches that, you know, your eardrums pop and you can't hear and, and things like that. They give you antibiotics for Two totally different types of ear infections, two totally different types of treatment, okay? For the swimmer's ear, the old adage of alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and vinegar works wonders. So you take one part of each. So whatever size container you're using, if you're using a cup, it's one cup of alcohol, one cup of hydrogen peroxide, one cup of vinegar. If you're doing it by the gallon, it's one gallon of alcohol, one gallon of hydrogen peroxide, one gallon of vinegar, okay? That's what I like about parts instead of actual amounts. Uh, ratios, much better. Uh, pour it in their ear, let it drain out. Don't keep it inside. Pour it in, drain it out. Um, the alcohol actually dries out. Usually, usually these ear infections are caused by moisture or something collecting inside the ear itself. The alcohol dries that out. It binds with the water, it pulls it out, it evaporates it out, it dries out the inside. The hydrogen peroxide is going to bubble and create a really oxygen rich environment, which usually helps kill the fungus. And vinegar creates an acidic environment, which usually helps kill the fungus. So those three things together all work together perfectly to take care of swimmer's ear. Either type of vinegar, AC or white. Doesn't matter if it's AC or white. Yep. The alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, not ethyl or methyl alcohol, isopropyl. So the stuff you get at the grocery store. And a warm compress is never a bad idea. The more you heat it up, the more the blood vessels are gonna dilate, the more blood flow you're gonna get, the better it's gonna help with the infection. So the first two are for outer ear infections, and then from warm compress down, are for inner or middle ear infections, otitis media. 
uh, mullein flour, just the little yellow flowers, and garlic. So to make that oil drop, you take one cup of mullein flowers and one garlic clove, press the garlic clove so it's all mushed and macerated, mix them together in that one cup, and then add one cup of extra virgin olive oil. You're gonna let it sit for two weeks. Turning it once a day for two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, strain it. Put it into an amber bottle or blue bottle with a glass dropper. You now have enough earache oil to take care of yourself for the two years that it'll last. And then make a new ones in two years. Okay. One to two drops inside of an ear with a cotton ball. The mullein flower um, acts as a topical analgesic. It numbs up the ear so that it doesn't hurt so bad. And the garlic is actually is an antibiotic. And it will absorb through the blood vessels in the ear and help fight the infection. Um, I would do that in conjunction with an ephedra nasal wash with your neti pot. Okay? Because the number one reason why kids get ear infections, or even adults for that matter, is that there's a tube that goes from your ear into your sinuses. And when that gets plugged, all the stuff that it's supposed to drain out doesn't drain out. And it rots and makes an infection. Um, the worst thing you can do is blow your nose. Stop blowing your noses. Okay? What you're doing is closing off the passages, creating high pressure, and you're blowing the bacteria from your oral cavity into that tube that connects to your ear, and you're pushing bacteria into your ears. So do the old farmer snort and spit. <laughs> Swallow it, spit it, do whatever you gotta do. Quit blowing your noses. Nine times out of 10, when you are blowing your nose and nothing is coming out, it's because it's not mucus that's congesting your sinuses, it's inflammation, it's swelling. That's why you can't breathe. It has nothing to do with mucus. But it has everything to do with blowing bacteria into your ears and causing ear infections. So stop blowing your noses. That's where that ephedra nasal wash comes into play. It goes into your nose and it shrinks all the swelling. It's much less habit forming than Afrin, which is down the list. Okay, Afrin works great, but it can be habit forming. It actually messes with the mucuses. Ephedra, on the other hand, does not. So it's a natural way to decrease the swelling. So if you've got a kid with an earache, you need to open up that tube that goes from the ear to their sinuses. Neti pot with ephedra, it'll decrease the swelling, it'll let it drain, and it'll keep their eardrums from rupturing. Oh, speaking of that, uh, the stuff, the oils, the garlic and mullein oil and the alcohol and hydrogen peroxide and vinegar, do not put it in the ears if the ear is ruptured. Okay? So if there's any kind of pus or anything, blood coming out of their ears at any point during this, do not put those in their ears. Okay? It's already draining. You don't need to do anything. It'll heal on its own. Um, You don't do any, you don't do any of the uh, well you don't do the top you don't do the top stuff. Don't put anything in their ears if they're if they're draining. If they've ruptured an eardrum, don't put anything inside their ears. On that note, Q-tips work great for cleaning guns. Are horrible for cleaning ears. Nothing smaller than your pinky should ever go inside your ear. Ever. <laughs> Good. Take the water as hot as you can stand in the shower or whatever. Let it go inside your ear. Let it sit there for a few minutes and then rinse it out. Do it again. Do not put Q-tips in your ears. You are increasing the wax production if you do that. And it's impossible because of the shape of the Q-tip to get a scoop on the end and you are pushing earwax up against your eardrums. 
and the cotton fibers inside are scratching the inside of the delicate tissues inside your ears, making them itch. And when they itch, they create more wax. So do not use Q-tips. If you're using them for your ears, get rid of them. They were great for cleaning guns, bad for ears. There are much other more natural ways to clean your ears than with Q-tips. So hot water will melt that water? Absolutely. It happens every time, every time I take a shower, I do this, and, uh, and sometimes I'll get out a, a flake or a chunk of earwax. Uh, don't use Q-tips. you take the nozzle and stick it in your No, I tilt my head into the stream so the water hits right here on the side of my head. And then I tilt my head so that it goes up into the, the crevice. Open your mouth when you do it. It will open up the passages, let more water inside. That warm, moist, hot water softens the earwax and it'll come right out. It'll float out. But for years, I hated it in the ER, we'd have to go in and irrigate ears with IV catheters because people are using Q-tips and cramming them in their ears, thinking they're doing a good job cleaning all the wax out and they're making it worse. If you don't believe me, talk to an ENT doc. They will tell you the same thing. Stop using Q-tips. What about hydrogen peroxide in the ear? Yeah, same thing, as long as it's diluted down. So you're only at 30%. Okay. You don't want to use hydrogen peroxide full strength ever. Okay. Uh, it's actually dangerous for your skin. Okay. It does what we call denatures the proteins in the cells of your skin or anywhere it talks to. So hydrogen peroxide, when you first get hurt, sure, not a problem. It's all gonna die anyway. It cleans it, but do not keep using hydrogen peroxide. Full strength. It needs to be diluted. You got different concentrations and you've got 12%, you've got 3%, you've got uh, 25%. Uh, you want to dilute it down to at least, in this case, about a 1% solution. Because it's one third of that solution is, is actually hydrogen peroxide. So most of the stuff you buy in the grocery store is going to be 3%. Um, <coughs> at our health and med store, we sell 12%. Um, <coughs> Yeah, it's overrated, in my opinion. Uh, Guaifenesin, this is Mucinex. If your lobelia and everything else we talked about that is a great expectorant for coughs and stuff isn't working, Mucinex is a great over-the-counter expectorant. If you've got a sinus infection that you just can't get rid of, and you know it's a sinus infection if when you push right here in the center of your forehead and it feels better, you've got a sinus infection. Okay, you're building up pressure in your frontal and maxillary sinuses. So when you push right here, it feels better. If that happens, drink lots of water, guaifenesin, and Afrin, or the, uh, the uh, ephedronasal wash. Okay, what you wanna do here is decrease the swelling inside your sinuses so that the opening can open up and then all the gunk will drain out. It's really kind of gross, it's kind of weird. You'll You'll do it, and then a few minutes later, you'll feel a pop, and then suddenly your nose will start to run, and you're coughing and <laughs> spitting out tons of mucus and gunky stuff, and it's all coming from your sinuses. Best thing to do is do regular neti, neti pot rinses, rinse your sinuses out on a regular basis. It's totally okay to do that. Um, if all of that doesn't work, amoxicillin, it's a great antibiotic for that kind of stuff. I put dental pain and ear pain here together because nine times out of 10, they're not really what they think they are. Your nerves in your ears and your teeth are connected. And so if you have a tooth infection, your ears are gonna hurt. And if you have an ear infection, your teeth are gonna hurt. And fortunately, um, the antibiotics wise, it's the same antibiotics. Um, but if you've got tooth pain or gum pain where you touch it and you're like, oh, that hurts, clove oil is an excellent, excellent thing to use for pain relief. In fact, that's what dentists used before lidocaine and novocaine. They would numb up the gums and the teeth with clove oil and work on your teeth. And if it hurt, they'd put more clove oil in and keep going. <laughs> and if it still hurt, well, then you just had a painful experience. 
if you have an abscess tooth, do all of this until it comes to a head. And it'll look like a pimple on the side of your gums. There'll be a white dot. Once there's a white dot, you can lance it and let it drain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't chew it. Oh, if, no, I said don't switch. Yeah, don't switch. Don't. You were going to go to another slide, and I'm not ready. Okay, you're right. I was about to switch. So sometimes you're going to have a tooth that is so infected it's actually abscessed down below. Uh, the tooth is probably going to die and come out on its own, but that abscess has got to drain somehow. Uh, warm compresses, um, clove oil, all of these antibiotic stuff we've been talking about up until now take those it'll help fight the infection make lots of dead white blood cells that's what pus is is white dead white blood cells it'll come to a head and once you can see a white spot poke the white spot with the needle and all this gunk nasty foul stuff will drain out it tastes terrible think rotten peanut butter <laughs> Isn't that delicious? Put it on a cracker. Hmm? Put it on a cracker with a little hot sauce. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff. All right, really common, pink eye. The real name is conjunctivitis. And the number one cause of pink eye is people having contaminated hands and rubbing their eyes. And usually you're rubbing your eyes because you're having seasonal allergies and they're itchy. So you're rubbing them constantly and your hands are dirty. Once the bacteria that don't live in your eyes get in your eyes, it's a great place for them to breed. And so you get these wonderful infections. It's extremely contagious. Usually if one person in the family gets it, you're all going to get it. Because hand hygiene is the number one concern here. Wash your hands, wash those nasty, nasty hands as much as you can if somebody in the family has got pink eye. Every doorknob, every handle, every sink faucet, every shower faucet, every toothbrush, hairbrush, anything your hand touches needs to be washed and decontaminated. And the person who's got pink eye, you need to isolate them. Stick them in a bedroom and don't let them leave until this is gone. And then when they're done, you need to sanitize their bedroom or closet whatever wherever you locked them up okay uh, seriously uh, it was such a don't let them out they can go to the potty and then sanitize the bathroom until it's gone <laughs> occasionally but you feed them they got to poo and if you water them they got to pee so this is this was such a bad problem overseas that we had a special isolation shipping container set aside just for pink eye. And it was a shipping container because then I could take bleach water afterwards and just spray the whole thing down and decontaminate it. If you got pink eye, you went inside there. You didn't leave. We brought a little porta potty in for you, a little bucket with a seat on it, and we brought your meals to you and you stayed there until it was gone. You didn't come out. Because once one person had it, the entire base could have pink eye. And that was just not acceptable. So um, extremely contagious. So how can you take care of it? Colloidal silver, right in the eyes, works wonders. Um, you can go to your doctor and get a prescription. And they're going to give you a little tube of what's called polymyosin B. And if you look at the ingredients of triple antibiotic or neosporin, it's the third ingredient is polymyosin B. So just regular old over-the-counter neosporin is just as effective and it's balanced for your eyes. It's safe to put in your eyes. You're going to be blurry for about half an hour as you're looking through all that Vaseline and uh, then your vision will clear up most of the way. But once you're on antibiotics, you're not contagious after 24 hours. So once you're getting treatment for pink eye, after 24 hours of antibiotic treatment, you're not contagious anymore. It may not be gone yet, but you're not contagious. So regular old neosporin.
works great. I like the little foil packets that you can buy by like 140 packets for like four bucks off the internet. Because if you try to get the tube of Neosporin <laughs> to squirt it in your eyelid, it's just not going to work and then you're going to contaminate your tube. So you get the little foil packs of, of triple antibiotic and you pull the eyelid out and you squirt it inside and you throw it away and you close the eyelid. Yep, but it works great for pink eye. UTIs. Water. Lots of it. Urinary tract infections. This is more common in women than men, more common in uncircumcised men than circumcised men. Um, the reason why it is more common in men, or sorry, in women, is because men are dirty. The reason why it is more common in women than men is because men are dirty. When you're having conjugal visits with your partner, <laughs> okay, it is super important that women urinate after intercourse because the mechanical action of intercourse pushes whatever nasty, funky thing was growing on guys because we're dirty right up the urethra towards the woman's bladder. It is very important that she urinate after intercourse. The second most common cause especially in, in young children, it's the most common cause, is not wiping the correct direction, okay? You gotta make sure that you teach your little girls to wipe from the front to the back, not the back to the front. And they'll have much less yeast infections, less more urinary tract infections. Um, I had a patient in Afghanistan, uh, the poor lady, uh, some of the international contractors that work on military bases d are there to make money. And it's a great way for them to make money. Um, but one of the, unfortunately, one of the side businesses they all run is prostitution. So you get, I had this one patient who was a prostitute on base, uh, had a raging urinary tract infection for almost three months. Nothing we did would take care of it because as soon as we would treat it, she was right back getting inoculated again. And uh, educated everything, hygiene everything, um, s multiple courses of antibiotics, Cipro, Bactrom, fun exotic stuff. Nothing worked to get rid of this lady's urinary tract infection. And it was getting so bad that it was infecting her kidneys. So I sent an email to my wife and said, sweetheart, send me some uva uracy. This is an herb. It's commonly called barberry or bearberry, depending on which part of the country you talk to. It's native to Oregon. Um, uva uracy. I had her send me some over. I made capsules out of it. And I gave it to this lady. And within 24 hours, her UTI was almost gone. It was so antibiotic resistant that none of our antibiotics were working. But Uva Yersi knocked it right out. And the doctors were like, all right, what's this voodoo magic you're doing over there? And so I taught them about it and they said, okay, well, get us some of that stuff because the prostitutes aren't the only ones having sex illegally on base. So all the female soldiers that would come in, they started giving them you have a URC instead. Marshmallow, this is not the white fluffy stuff in the grocery store you're thinking it is. This is actually a plant and it's the root of the plant that you want. Marshmallow root. You mix these at a two to one ratio. So two parts you have a URC, one part marshmallow root. Marshmallow root acts as a mucilaginous layer to help line the, the bladder, to help protect it and fortify the mucus layers to get, and it actually helps force the bacteria off of the, the lining inside the bladder. Um, this is an extremely very common problem for, for women. Uh, and again, for uncircumcised men, it can be a very big problem to for them too. Uh, if you can take care of it naturally without antibiotics, wonderful. If you do need antibiotics, Cipro and Bactrim are your two antibiotics of choice. If you're allergic to sulfa drugs, take Cipro, 
Otherwise, take the sulfa drugs.